Saudi Arabia has more than 40 trillion liters of oil. They can afford almost any solution. But you can't buy fresh water when there isn't any. The country is 95% desert with virtually no rivers. Temperatures exceed 50 degrees Celsius. Rainfall barely reaches 100 millimeters annually. Traditional water sources like underground aquifers are depleting fast. Yet 37 million people live here. By every measure, this population shouldn't exist here. But it does, sustained entirely by fresh water that had to be engineered into existence. The system that produces it spans the length of a route from New York to Tokyo, operates continuously in extreme heat, and consumes a massive fraction of the country's energy. And by 2030, they need to double its capacity. How do you manufacture an entire nation's water supply when importing it isn't an option? And what infrastructure makes that possible in one of the planet's most hostile environments? In 1974, Saudi Arabia made a decision that would define its water future for the next 50 years. The government established the Saline Water Conservation Corporation, transforming desalination from experimental technology into national policy. The timing was driven by crisis. The Red Sea and Persian Gulf coastlines held most of the population, while the interior remained largely empty. For decades, the country had pumped underground aquifers, with agriculture alone consuming 80% of available water. But those reserves were finite and running out fast. Without a solution, the nation faced an impossible choice – abandon growth or import water at costs that would cripple the economy. The answer came from the ocean. But seawater contains approximately 3.5% salt – far too concentrated for human consumption or crop irrigation. Breaking the molecular bonds between salt and water requires intense pressure and advanced technology. Saudi engineers built an infrastructure rivaling the complexity of their oil industry, creating a manufactured water cycle that operates continuously across one of the planet's most hostile environments. The system operates in two stages – production and distribution. 33 desalination plants line the Red Sea and Persian Gulf coasts positioned where seawater intake is straightforward. But Saudi Arabia's major cities – Riyadh, Mecca, Taif – sit hundreds of kilometers inland. Water produced at sea level must travel across desert terrain, climb mountain ranges, and arrive at pressure sufficient for distribution networks. The solution required building a pipeline network stretching 14,217 kilometers, longer than the entire Trans-Siberian Railway. These aren't residential water lines. Transmission pipes measure up to 3 meters in diameter, carrying flow rates that exceed 1 million cubic meters per day on major corridors. Construction began in the 1970s and continues today, with 1,600 kilometers of additional pipeline planned by 2030. Building infrastructure at this scale in temperatures that swing 50 degrees Celsius and terrain that shifts between soft sand and solid rock required engineering precision from the first weld. High-strength carbon steel forms the backbone of the system. Rectangular steel plates are cut to precise dimensions, then fed through multi-axis rolling machines, where they gradually bend until the edges meet. Each section measures about 12 meters long and maintains walls nearly 25 millimeters thick. Automated welding systems complete up to 150 joints per day on large diameter transmission pipes. Every joint undergoes automated ultrasonic inspection before workers apply a multi-component liquid epoxy coating. Construction crews prepare corridors approximately 40 meters wide, allowing the installation process to advance at 1.5 kilometers per day. Survey teams use GPS systems to mark exact alignments, avoiding weak soils and erosion zones. Large tracked excavators dig trenches to precise widths and depths. Along sections crossing steep mountain terrain, controlled explosives carve trenches directly into solid rock, creating space to seat the pipeline securely, even where mechanical excavation proves impossible. Crews spread fine sand along trench bottoms to create bedding layers that distribute loads uniformly and reduce stress concentrations. But pipelines only solve distribution. The challenge is production, turning seawater into freshwater at industrial scale. Inside those coastal facilities, the process operates continuously 24 hours per day. 
Each plant processes millions of litres, stripping salt from ocean water through a series of filtration and pressure stages that took decades to perfect. The transformation begins several hundred metres offshore, where intake lines pull water directly from the ocean. A 63-centimetre pipe can draw up to 15 million litres per day, more than 10,000 litres per minute. Open intake screens catch large debris, while barriers prevent marine life from entering. Everything larger than 4.5 millimetres gets blocked by massive screens. The water passes through finer screens and then flows downward through sand filtration tanks using gravity. Gaps between sand grains allow only water to pass, while suspended particles get trapped. Large paddles stir the water, while plant operators add sodium hypochlorite as a disinfectant and ferric chloride as a coagulant. The coagulant causes particles to clump together and settle. Cartridge filtration systems with pore sizes as small as 1 to 5 microns catch remaining microscopic particles. Then comes reverse osmosis, where the fundamental transformation happens. Salt ions cling tightly to water molecules through electrostatic attraction. High-powered centrifugal pumps generate pressure reaching about 60 bar, roughly 60 times atmospheric pressure, forcing water through ultrafine membranes while salt stays behind. A second stage uses even finer membranes for higher efficiency, stripping out remaining ions. Plant operators then adjust pH by adding balancing solutions, and remineralization adds calcium and magnesium to restore the mineral profile and natural taste. The treated water enters the distribution network. Older thermal plants consumed about 15 kilowatt hours per cubic meter. Modern reverse osmosis facilities have achieved remarkable efficiency gains, with Jubail 3A plants reaching 2.8 kilowatt hours per cubic meter an 81% reduction. Recent projects achieved production costs as low as 41 cents per cubic meter, making large-scale desalination economically viable. That cost breakthrough made the next phase possible, scaling up faster than ever before. Saudi Arabia committed $80 billion to expand desalination capacity with the broader water infrastructure portfolio, including pipelines, treatment plants, and transmission systems, reaching $120 billion under Vision 2030. Two facilities demonstrate what this investment delivers. The Ras Al Care complex produces over 1 million cubic meters daily, enough water for 3.5 million people. This $7.2 billion facility required building on reclaimed land, involving massive coastal earthworks from 2010 to 2014. The plant combines reverse osmosis trains with multi-stage flash thermal units in a hybrid configuration. The Jubail 3A facility, also known as Jaslar, reached its completion in just 27 months, producing 600,000 cubic meters per day. This plant achieved world records for energy efficiency and production cost at industrial scale. The Al Hadar mountain tunnel represents one of the most difficult expansion sections. This 12.5 kilometer tunnel through solid rock took 19 months to complete and stands as one of the world's longest water pipeline tunnels. It carries water from the coast to Taif, climbing through elevation changes that would otherwise require excessive pumping energy. But pumping energy represents only a fraction of the system's total consumption. At peak capacity, thermal desalination consumed 1.5% of Saudi Arabia's total energy production, requiring massive fossil fuel consumption. Modern reverse osmosis plants dramatically reduce energy consumption. The Jubail 3A plant pioneered the transition to renewable power at industrial scale with a 45.5 megawatt solar array providing roughly 20% of its operating energy. By 2030, targets call for a 50-50 split between renewable and natural gas power, with carbon neutrality planned for 2060. This transition frees oil and gas resources for exports or petrochemical production. Yet energy isn't the only environmental challenge. Desalination generates 31 million cubic meters of brine daily, 22% of global output. Currently, pumping concentrated salt back to the ocean creates dead zones through increased salinity and temperature, causing coral bleaching and reduced biodiversity. The next phase targets reducing this environmental impact. Brine mining projects aim to extract 2 million tons of sodium chloride annually, along with 3,500 tons of bromine, representing the first domestic production. Magnesium and potassium compounds suitable for fertilizer add more value, 
Revenue projections reach $400 million per year by 2030, potentially subsidizing water costs by 50%. Zero liquid discharge technologies aim to minimize ocean dumping by treating brine as feedstock rather than waste, though implementing these systems at the scale of Saudi Arabia's operation remains a significant engineering challenge. Technology solves production, but demand management determines whether the system keeps pace with growth. Per capita usage peaked at 265 litres per day in 2017, among the world's highest rates. Heavily subsidized pricing encouraged waste. Reforms introduced tiered pricing structures and smart metering systems. By 2023, consumption dropped to 102 litres per day, a 61% reduction, effectively creating new capacity without building additional infrastructure. Agricultural water use faced the largest adjustments. Farming historically consumed the majority of available water, growing crops poorly suited to desert conditions. Policies shifted subsidies toward less water-dependent crops. The agricultural share has declined significantly, freeing resources for urban use. Cloud seeding operations use five aircraft to increase rainfall. The technology boosts precipitation from seeded clouds by up to 20%. Wastewater treatment offers another avenue. Saudi Arabia reuses 21% of treated wastewater, with targets to increase this to 70% by the end of the decade. In March 2025, contracts will be signed for 16 decentralized plants totaling 18,000 cubic meters per day. These smaller facilities reduce transmission costs and improve water security for isolated populations. Yet even with these gains, the system faces unprecedented demand. 37 million people depend on this infrastructure for 70% of the urban water supply. Vision 2030 calls for massive urban expansion, with Riyadh's population targeted to grow from 7 million to 20 million. The NEON project requires 500,000 cubic meters per day from renewable power desalination. Jeddah and Dammam face similar growth projections. Two billion people live in water-scarce regions worldwide, making the Saudi experience directly relevant from Australia to Chile to Namibia. The transformation from energy-intensive thermal desalination to highly effective reverse osmosis shows what becomes possible when engineering advances meet economic necessity. Production costs dropped from several dollars per cubic meter to 41 cents. Renewable energy integration proves that desalination does not require fossil fuel dependence. Brine mining demonstrates how waste streams can become revenue sources. By 2030, total capacity will reach 20 million cubic meters per day. Wastewater reuse will hit 70%. Renewable energy will power half of all desalination. 50 years ago, Saudi Arabia drew water from depleting aquifers and energy-guzzling thermal plants. Today, they engineer a modern hydrological cycle turning seawater into fresh water at world record efficiency, powered increasingly by solar energy. Every cubic meter of water, every kilometer of pipeline, every solar-powered membrane plant represents the difference between urban expansion and water rationing for millions of people. It proves that geography does not determine density when engineering meets determination. For Saudi Arabia, manufacturing its own water was never optional. Now, what do you think? If needed, could any other country in the world also manufacture its own water? Share your thoughts in the comments. Don't forget to like this video and subscribe to our channel. Thanks for watching.